Exercise L15. Getting all the facts. 1. So, Victoria C. Woodhall is best remembered as, uh, for being the first woman candidate to run for the U.S. presidency. She did this in 1872 against Ulysses S. Grant. Now, in fact, Woodhall had long been involved in many radical movements, movements including spiritualism, utopian socialism, and women's rights. She was a first, the first woman in other endeavors as well. Let's see. In 1868, she co-founded the first woman-owned brokerage firm. And a couple years later, she established an outspoken political journal a journal which promoted a variety of extreme views. Although Woodhall lost the presidential election, she continued her political work for several decades. However, over time with less radical views and uh, with a quieter public profile. What details about Victoria C. Woodhall's life does the lecture include? Two. Okay, now the coral reef is right below us. So, first, I want all of you to check all your diving equipment. Do you have a full oxygen tank? Is all your equipment functioning properly? Okay, everyone ready? Now I want everyone, each of you, to, to find your diving partner. Once you're in the water, remember, stay with your diving partner. Stay together. You should always have someone with you who can signal for help in case of an emergency. Uh, my diving partner isn't here today. Is there anyone else who doesn't have a partner? Uh, someone who needs a partner? There doesn't seem to be anyone without a partner, so you can join Linda and Jeff, okay? The three of you, keep an eye on each other. Now, stay together as we descend to the coral reef. It's only about 25 feet below. Follow me as I go along the reef and try to identify the kinds of corals we looked at in class. I'll give a signal when it's time to return to the boat. What details are included in the diving teacher's instructions to the students? Three. Dr. Jackson, I was reading an article the other day, and it referred to a study, a, a phenomenon, called the Hundredth Monkey Phenomenon. It didn't explain the study, but I was curious to know more about it. Are you familiar with it? Um, yes, I am. Um, this study involved a group of monkeys inhabiting an island off the coast of Japan. The monkeys were shown how to eat sweet potatoes in a particular way a way that wasn't typical of monkeys. Supposedly, other monkeys living on the island began to copy this behavior, and soon a hundred monkeys were eating sweet potatoes in the new way. At this point, it is claimed that monkeys from another island about 200 miles away began eating, began the same sweet potato-eating behavior. These monkeys had never been in contact with the monkeys on the first island. That's really intriguing. Why do you sound so, uh, skeptical? Well, let me say this. It doesn't sound very likely, and I haven't seen the study mentioned in a serious journal. Only in a popular science magazine that might not have investigated the source of the research. What details about the hundredth monkey study does the professor give? Four. Okay, um, for my presentation, I decided to talk about puppetry. First, I'm going to talk about some traditional puppets, and, and then I'm going to go into some more unusual puppets. So, uh, puppetry is an art form used for entertainment and education. It consists of a show in which puppets, 
figures made to represent humans and other creatures, these can be authentic or mythical representation. They are used to tell a story. So traditional puppets come in many forms. The most common type of puppet and the easiest to make and use, and one that I'm sure all of you have played with at some time in your lives, is the hand puppet. So this puppet is, you know, like a glove and is worn over the hand of the puppeteer. You, the puppeteer, work the head and arms of the puppet by moving your fingers. Okay? So another common type of puppet is known as the marionette. That's the one that looks kind of like a doll and has all these joints on the body and you control it by moving, well, manipulating the strings. The puppeteer usually stands on a bridge over the stage and makes the marionette move by pulling the strings. Okay? And the last traditional puppet I'm going to talk about is the third kind of puppet, the shadow puppet. Now, these puppets are controlled by rods. These rods are attached to their hands, the, the puppet's hands, and the puppeteer makes the puppet move by manipulating the rods from below the stage. So the legs of the figure hang loosely, kind of dangling down, and have freedom of movement. The performance with these kinds of puppets takes place behind a screen with lighting set up so that the puppet casts a shadow. What details about puppetry does the presentation include? Exercise L16. Recognizing Information. 1. The homing instinct of pigeons. Uh, pigeons have a homing instinct, and this is what makes them popular for racing. But you have to start training a bird when it's young, so a bird's training begins when it's about seven year uh, excuse me, seven weeks old. At first, this training consists of giving it short exercise flights, teaching the bird to recognize its owner's call. It also has to be taught to enter its coat. Oh, a coat, the pigeon's home. Then the next phase. When the bird is about four months old, the next phase of training is started. In this stage, the pigeon is taken short distances from its home and then released. So the distance of these flights is gradually extended from three miles up to a hundred miles as the bird's stamina increases. And then, when the bird, the pigeon is ready, the owner may enter it in a race against other trained pigeons. So the owners take their birds to a central meeting place and all the birds are tagged. The tag is a small metal ring attached to one leg. Then they are released all at once, simultaneously. All these birds take off for home. Now a bird is not considered to be home until it has entered its coat. That's why it's important to teach it to enter its coat. And its owner removes the tag, and this is inserted into this special kind of clock that records the bird's arrival time. Oh, because owners live at different distances from the release point. The first pigeon home may not be the fastest flyer. It's the bird that makes the best time in flying the distance home. That bird is the winner. In the lecture, the speaker describes the steps in pigeon training. Indicate whether each of the following is a step in the process. Two. I, I wanted to talk today about the American suffragettes who uh, finally won their battle for the right to vote when the right to vote in a democratic election was, was extended to women in 1919. But because of women's equal rights being harmed by discriminatory legislation, the ERA, uh, um, Equal Rights Amendment, was introduced in 1923. This was a special time when the feminist symbolized a young generation of women. It was a time in America's history young women were carefree, exuberant, 
eager to break out of traditional roles and enjoy personal independence. All this optimism came to an end during the Great Depression, an economic crisis precipitated by a stock market crash in 1929. Okay? At the depth of the Depression, over one-third of the labor force, let me repeat that, one-third of the labor force, that is, one out of every three people was unemployed. As you can imagine, as men lost their jobs, they, they became resentment, uh, resentful. They became resentful toward those women who had jobs, whose jobs were protected because of the uh, Equal Rights Amendment. This resentment became widespread, and laws were passed that restricted women's rights. One such law was uh, the Married Persons Clause. Okay? Uh, the Married Persons Clause prevented the civil service from hiring more than one member of a family. This law left many women unemployed. Following the assumption that a man is or should be the primary wage earner, many school boards fired married women. E even women in positions of power supported policies that made women's conditions worse rather than improve them. Now, at the same time that women were losing their rights, there was a propaganda campaign by social workers and public figures which was intended and, and effectively did its job of convincing women that their responsibility, their duty, was to maintain family values. A, a consequence of this campaign was the strengthening of belief in traditional roles and uh, an, an acceptance on the part of women to, to stay at home instead of pursue a career. In the lecture, the professor describes events that undermined the gains the suffragettes had made in women's rights. Indicate whether each of the following is an event that hampered the movement. Three. In the natural world, a multitude of symbiotic relationships has developed um, between different organisms. In many of these, the partnership is one-sided. In other words, one of the symbionts, the two creatures involved in the partnership, one of the symbionts benefits from the association while the other may be harmed by it. Sometimes two species develop a relationship that is beneficial to both parties. This is called mutualism. Okay, so... A symbiotic relationship in which both organisms benefit is called mutualism. Let me give you an example of such an alliance. The relationship of ants and aphids. Aphids are tiny, pear-shaped insects that typically feed exclusively on a particular plant. I think most of you have seen them. They live in crowded clusters on the underside of leaves or on stems. The aphid's mouth parts are adapted to piercing plant tissue and sucking out the sap. They're very efficient at getting the sap, but they can't metabolize it all, so they have to get rid of it, okay? So, from the back of the insects are two cornicles, kind of like a tailpipe of a car, protruding from the back of the insects. The aphids get rid of this sap by secreting it from these tailpipes, these cornicles. Um, this sap, a sticky substance called honeydew, is high in nutritive value. The honeydew falls onto the ground or onto the leaves of the plant and is collected by ants. The ants use this honeydew substance as a food source. Some ant species stroke the back end of aphids. Sometimes these aphids are called the ants' cows. The ants stroke the aphids with their legs and antennae in order to stimulate the flow of the honeydew liquid. It's thought that aphids may actually withhold the honeydew, waiting until ants caress them. Some ants take care of whole herds of aphids. They build shelters for the aphids and carry them to new plants, to new plants when the old plants die. So, the aphids' mouth parts, as I said, are adapted to piercing the leaves and sucking out sap. 
In contrast, the ant's mouthparts are not well modified for getting the sap from plants. So the ants rely on the aphids to get the sap for them. The aphids are not well adapted for fighting off predators, and consequently they rely on ants to provide this protection service for them. See the mutualism? Both these creatures, ants and aphids, benefit from this arrangement of close cooperation. This relationship is somewhat analogous to the relationship between cattle and human beings. In the lecture, the professor describes a relationship between ants and aphids. Indicate whether each of the following is a benefit that aphids get from ants. Exercise L17. Organizing Information. 1. It may be true that no two snowflakes are exactly alike, but they can be classified by their shape, and this is dictated by the way water molecules in the atmosphere react to temperatures. Good snowflake formation needs low temperatures. Okay. So what are the different shapes, and what influences the final shape that a snowflake takes? Now, there are three different types of snowflakes. The most familiar type of these three basic types is the star, which looks like the common picture book illustration of a star with six points. The second type, type two, is a solid prism shape, a column, like a section cut through a lead pencil. The third type, the plate, looks like a tiny hexagonal dinner plate. Okay, so how do they get those shapes? Well, extreme conditions like those in the polar areas produce the perfect prisms. But there isn't enough precipitation there, in the polar areas, for stars to form. Stars need precipitation in order to form. So you usually don't find stars at the poles. The plates are sort of in between the prisms and stars. Plates need higher temperatures than those found at the poles where the prisms form, but they need less humidity than is needed for the formation of stars. Now, in places where the temperature is too high or where there's a high wind, snowflakes tend to be irregular. The crystals have not really formed properly, or have become damaged by the weather conditions. That's why we frequently don't see nice formations here, and of course, since we don't live at the poles, we never see prisms. The speaker talks about the shapes of snowflakes. Match each type below with the conditions under which it develops. Two. Many folk cures that have been around for centuries may be more therapeutic, uh, more medically useful than previously suspected. Some home remedies have been found to have antiviral properties, and others have antibacterial properties. So, um, the importance of documenting these remedies and experimenting to see if they really work can't be overemphasized. A case in point is the wormwood plant. This plant has been used for hundreds of years in China and Vietnam to combat malaria. In fact, an early record of wormwood, of the um, medicinal use of wormwood, was found in a recipe discovered in a Southeast Asian tomb, uh, a, a tomb dating from 168 B.C. So, the properties of the wormwood were closely investigated, and a new anti-malarial drug came out of this study. So its antiviral properties led to the development of a drug for malaria. Because, because the research found that it was indeed effective against this virus. So its antiviral properties were found to be correct. Another case is um, sugar. See, in parts of South America, a powder obtained from grinding sugarcane is used for healing infections in wounds. 
and this usage may date back several hundred years. So, experiments carried out on several hundred patients indicated that ordinary sugar in high concentrations kills off bacteria. Its suction effect helps by eliminating dead cells and creating a, a, a glass-like layer and this glass-like layer protects the wound and ensures its healing. Um, another antibacterial folk medicine that scientists are investigating is one used by Arab fishermen who rub their wounds with a venomous catfish to quicken healing. Uh, this catfish excretes a gel-like slime and... This slime has been found to contain not only antibiotics, but a, a coagulant that helps close injured blood vessels, anti-inflammatory agents, and a chemical that directs production of a glue-like material that aids healing. Because traditional herbal treatments are often locally available and inexpensive, that makes them ideal for use by local people. Documentation of traditional medicines worldwide needs to be undertaken before those traditions are lost. An analysis of the substances can be made, and art of synthetic substances can be developed for human use around the world. The speaker talks about folk cures and what they were used for. Match the folk treatment to the properties it supposedly has. Three. Today, I want to talk about the development of refrigeration. There is evidence that early humans stored food underwater. They, early humans, probably noticed that their meat would last longer if it was kept underwater or stored in a cave or um, was packed in snow. Later, ice was actively harvested from frozen lakes and rivers and this ice would be stored in uh, specially constructed buildings called ice houses to preserve food until the following winter. Is anyone familiar with these buildings? Yes, Tom. Well, yeah. In my hometown, there's one that's been made into a museum. I think it was used to store ice um, until the 1920s. Uh-huh. Could you uh, describe the building for us? Uh, well... It's a large windowless building, a brick and stone building, and the ice blocks were packed in straw so that the ice would, wouldn't would melt. The straw kept the ice from melting for a while anyway. Okay, yeah, that's a good description of an ice house. A later storage container was the ice box. And what would be the advantages of an ice box, an ice box over an ice house? Susan? Well, as I understand it, the ice box is a kind of early refrigerator. So ice houses served whole communities, whereas ice boxes were small enough to put in your house. So um, it was more private and good for house of uh, domestic use. They kind of look like a cupboard, often with legs, and were made of wood. Uh-huh, that's correct. The inside of the box was lined with tin or zinc, and sawdust was frequently used for insulation purposes. Blocks of ice were delivered to people's homes like morning newspapers. So when do you think this method of refrigeration began to be obsolete? Presumably when modern electric refrigerators were introduced. Ice boxes didn't use electricity, did they? That's right, Tom. That's right. And refrigeration technology didn't stop there. It continues to develop today. The class discussion is about the development of refrigeration. Match each description with the corresponding form of refrigeration. Four. In underground cave systems, rainfall containing minerals absorbed from carbonate rock and plant debris builds up formations known as speleothems. Let me spell that for you. S-P-E-L-E-O-T-H-E-M-S Speleothems, the formations that build up in caves. So over geological time, 
A variety of fantastically shaped structures can develop within a cave system. I'd like to talk about the different speleothems and how they're formed, usually by one of two types of water conditions, water dripping or water flowing. For some speleothems to develop, mineral-laden water drips through the cave roof. The minerals from the dripping water start to build up vertical elongated hollow tubes hanging from the ceiling of the cave. These tubes are known as soda straws. They look like a soda straw, and water drips from them like when you take a straw out of a drink. So drops of water run down the inside of the tube, leaving mineral residues at the opening. Over time, these soda straws can build up to several feet in length, and eventually they become plugged up, so the water can't run through the straw anymore. So it runs down the outside surface. When this happens, this dripping down the outside of the straw, the formation evolves into an icicle-shaped stalactite. Of course, this constant dripping of water off the end of the straw, or the stalactite, hits the floor of the cave under the formation. And this builds up a vertical formation rising from the floor directly underneath of the stalactite. And this formation is known as a stalagmite. Stalagmites typically have rounded ends due to the water splashing down from above. But their shapes vary a lot. Sometimes stalactites and stalagmites grow together to form a column from floor to ceiling. Other kinds of formations found in caves, besides soda straws, stalactites, and stalagmites, are those formed by flowing water. Okay? So, sometimes the water flows down the inclined ceiling of a cave, and when this happens, the mineral solution is deposited in thin trails. The deposits build up in a series of ripples and folds, and it looks like a layer of cloth. This kind of speleothem is called a drapery. You can visualize this speleothem as a piece of cloth draped over a ramp of some sort. Okay, now, if the water falls down a vertical surface instead of a slope, the resulting formations take on the appearance of a waterfall, and this is known as flowstone. Now, speleothems are found in a variety of colors as well as shapes. This is due to the impurities, both natural and artificial, that mix with the dripping or flowing water as it seeps underground. The professor talks about cave formations. Match each cave formation with the corresponding water condition. Listening mini test 2. Questions 1 through 4. Listen to part of a discussion in an environmental science class. It's now well established that our planet's protective ozone layer has been thinning in recent decades. This ozone layer lies between 15 and 30 kilometers above the Earth's surface and absorbs ultraviolet rays emitted by the sun. You all know about using skin creams and sunglasses for protection against ultraviolet rays. The thinning of the ozone layer, the loss of ozone is caused because artificial chemicals called chlorofluorocarbons, or CFCs, combine with the oxygen atoms of the ozone. So every oxygen atom that combines with CFCs, this chemical reaction between CFCs and oxygen is what is, um, how the amount of ozone is being depleted. Um, this ozone depletion has serious consequences because the more ultraviolet light reaches the Earth, the Earth's surface, the more damage it causes in DNA in humans and animals. The most well-known effect of this is the recent dramatic increase in skin cancers. So who's responsible for creating these CFCs? I mean, we've known about this for a long time. Isn't something being done about it? Well, to answer your first question, um, who's responsible, 
Well, in a sense, we all are. CFCs are a main component of dry cleaning and refrigerating chemicals. They are also produced in various manufacturing processes and in nitrogen fertilizers and aerosols used in products like hairsprays and polishes. Isn't something being done about it? Uh, your second question. Well, yes. Uh, fortunately, CFC's use in aerosols has been phased out in most countries. But these chemicals are dispersed in the lower atmosphere where they can linger for years before migrating to the stratosphere where the damage is done. Dr. Alameda, this all sounds very pessimistic. Haven't there been international agreements to phase out CFCs? Yes. In fact, since 1985, several international conventions have produced agreements. So, uh, would you say you're optimistic about the future, the future of the ozone layer? I would say that, that I'm guardedly optimistic for the long-term future. It's true that the various agreements are beginning to take effect. The problem is that it takes many years for the CFCs to disperse. And the fact is, not all countries are enthusiastic about phasing out their production for economic reasons. However, it's generally hoped that the ozone layer will recover completely by the year 2060, if we all abide by the international agreements. 1. In the discussion, the professor briefly explains the process that breaks down the ozone layer. Indicate whether each of the sentences is a step in the process of ozone depletion. Two, why is the professor cautious in her prediction of the future? Three, according to the professor, how do CFCs get into the atmosphere? Four, according to the discussion, which of the following are contaminants? Questions 5 through 8. Listen to part of a lecture in a psychology class. Okay, we all know that people can and do influence each other. However, the real question, the disturbing question is, how far can people's minds be influenced against their own will? There are three techniques that have been used in attempts to control other people's behavior and I'd like to tell you a little about each one of these techniques. One technique, subliminal perception, is frequently referred to as subception. This technique is based on the observation that people notice a great deal more than they consciously realize. This is not a new observation. We've been aware of it for a long time. But it has been given special attention since the results of an experiment that took place in a New York movie theater were reported. In this experiment, what they did was, well, an advertisement for ice cream was flashed onto the screen during the feature film. Apparently, the ad was shown for such a brief moment that no one consciously saw the intrusion. Got the picture? Everyone was watching the movie and being shown an ice cream ad so quickly that they weren't aware of it. What was found was that ice cream sales increased dramatically. You could say they soared for the duration of the time that the experiment continued. That was subception. Hypnosis is another technique that can be used for controlling people's minds. Okay, so while in a deep trance, People can be told to do something at a specific time or at a certain signal. They can also be told that they won't remember anything when they come out of the trance, what had been said or what they were told to do at what particular signal once out of the trance. 
This is called a post-hypnotic suggestion. It's still unclear whether a subject can be made to carry out an action that otherwise would be unacceptable in that person's mind. The third technique I want to mention is brainwashing. Brainwashing entails forcing people to believe something, usually something false, by continually telling them or showing them evidence that's supposedly true. The person being brainwashed is uh, prevented from thinking about whatever it is, thinking about it properly, or considering other evidence. Now, Brainwashing can take some extreme forms. For example, brainwashing can be done by first causing a complete breakdown of individuals. This is done through acts such as starving them, preventing them from sleeping, intimidating them, and keeping them in a state of constant fear. Eventually, the person, the individual, loses their sense of reality. And when this happens, New, false ideas can be planted in their minds. 5. In the lecture, the professor describes three types of mind control. Match each behavior with the associated mind control technique. Six. According to the professor, what is true of subliminal perception? Seven. What else is true of subliminal perception? Eight. Which of the following did the professor not mention when speaking about brainwashing? <phone rings> Questions 9 through 12. Listen to part of a lecture on biotechnology. Nature has always provided a stimulus for inventive minds. Look at early flying machines. They clearly were an attempt to emulate the freedom of birds. Architects and engineers have often consciously modeled buildings on forms found in nature. A more recent example of inspiration from nature is the invention of that common fastening device, Velcro. The inventor of Velcro was out walking his dog and noticed that small burrs, you know those seed pods that get attached to your clothes? Small burrs had become entangled in his dog's coat by grasping the hairs with tiny hooks. This led him to invent a synthetic fabric, one whose surfaces mimic the clasping properties of these natural seed pods that he was pulling out of his dog's coat. Animals and plants have evolved solutions to the same kinds of problems that often interest engineers and designers. So lots of current research in material science is concerned with actively examining the natural world, especially at the molecular level, for inspiration to develop materials with novel properties. This is a relatively new field of study, sometimes known as biomimetics, since it consciously attempts to mimic nature. I don't need to write that on the board, do I? Bio from biology and mimetics from mime or mimic. Okay? Biomimetics. Okay. Well, researchers have been investigating several interesting areas. Well, what I think are interesting areas. For example... They've studied how the molecular structure of antler bone contributes to its amazing toughness, how the skin structure of a worm contributes to its ability to crawl, how the sea cucumber softens its skeleton and changes shape so that it can squeeze through tiny gaps in rocks, or um, what gives wood its high resistance to impact. 
These investigations have led to several breakthroughs in the development of composite materials with remarkable properties. Predictions for future inventions that may be developed from these lines of research include so-called smart structures. Those are structures that design and repair themselves in a similar way to a variety of processes in the natural world. For example, engineers have envisaged bridges that would detect areas heavily stressed by vehicle movement or wind. See, the bridge structure would automatically add or, or move material to the weak areas until the stress is reduced. The same principle might be used to repair damaged buildings. Other new materials that have been imagined are substances that would copy photosynthesis in green plants. What good is that, you might ask? Well, photosynthesis could be a way to create new energy sources. The potential impact of biomimetic research is so great that we may end up calling the 21st century the age of materials. 9. In the lecture, the professor explains the field of study called biomimetics. Indicate whether each of the following is an example of biomimetic application. Ten. According to the professor, what inspires architects and engineers? Eleven. When talking about smart structures, what is the professor doing? Twelve. What are some of the areas that researchers are investigating? Questions 13 through 16. Listen to part of a discussion in a criminology class. Today I'd like to look at the problem of theft theft of cultural antiquities and art. You probably aren't aware that what a large problem it is. Let me give you some facts. Illegal trafficking in cultural property has become a massive criminal activity, so massive that today it ranks in economic terms alongside illegal trading in weapons or drugs. Think about that. Equal to the illegal trade in weapons and drugs. Okay, so where do these art treasures come from? Well, in fact, no part of the world is immune from this problem. Works of art are stolen from museums and looted from historic or religious buildings everywhere, and eventually they find their way to wealthy buyers. Frequently, smaller stone or wooden carvings are simply cut or chopped away from a wall or base sadly destroying the integrity of the overall work. In some regions of the world, these thefts have seriously reduced the stock of national treasures. So, what kinds of measures do you think would be most appropriate for dealing with this situation? Anyone? Yes, Luis? Well, electronic surveillance of exhibitions and historical monuments would help. Okay, electronic surveillance. That, no doubt, would act as a deterrent and would be a very good means of combating some thefts. But that's not always an affordable or practical option. It can be too expensive, and especially since many cultural objects are located in remote places, not practical at all. Other ideas for dealing with thefts? Yes? Isn't there a move to get owners, uh, countries, to catalog their cultural possessions? Yes, Mary, there is. Remember that one of the chief problems in policing this kind of crime is that very often, too often, the original owners, whether they're governments, museums, or private collectors, these owners can't furnish an accurate description of the property that's been stolen. 
and therefore they can't prove their ownership. So, yes, there are several organizations concerned with combating this illegal trade by stressing the importance of owners making accurate inventories. These inventories should include relevant data, data about the object, data such as data fabrication, kind of material, shape, size, the presence of any kind of identifying markings. Of course, these inventories should also include detailed photographic illustrations. So if a thief takes something, let's say a painting, and cuts it up into pieces, selling it as two or three different paintings, a piece can still be identified as coming from the original. But inventories by themselves can't prevent this trade. It just kind of helps in the recovery, and this information can only be really useful if it's widely available to all the people involved in policing. Customs agents, border guards? Yes, yes, you're absolutely right, Luis. In fact, the development of electronic networks allows the various police forces to use inventories to identify objects and to disseminate information about the objects to any of many official offices worldwide. This information can also be used by customs agencies, the insurance industry, and cultural heritage organizations. Can you think of any other measures that might help stem this illegal trade? Yes? Well, I think it seems like a person could buy an artifact without being aware of its historical or cultural value, or that the object may have been stolen. So maybe travelers should be told about this danger. This might go a long way to reducing the trade. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Well, I was thinking not so much about the theft, but how do customs people recognize that something is illegal art as opposed to some cheap trinket? I mean, when we, when my family went to Mexico to see the Mayan pyramids in the Yucatan, well, there were lots of peddlers selling things like, well, copies of Mayan artifacts. And um, how would a border official recognize if a particular person is a tourist, is crossing with a trinket, or someone trying to smuggle in a priceless treasure. Yeah, say a farmer finds a Mayan piece in his field and sells it to a tourist, without either of them understanding its value. And, of course, there would be no inventory, uh, no record of the item when the tourist crosses the border. How would a border guard recognize that? I mean, if it were stolen, there might be a report, and the guard is on the lookout, or... A smuggler might give himself away through a body language or something. But a tourist... Or think about the long border between Mexico and the States. A smuggler could wade across the Rio Grande. And the border guards are more concerned with drug smuggling or illegal immigration. So someone with what looks like a trinket, an official might think this is just a guy bringing trinkets into the States. 13. According to the discussion, which of the following is true about the illegal trade in art? Fourteen. What does the professor say about inventories of cultural properties? Fifteen. Which problems in policing the trade in national treasures were discussed? Sixteen. What does the professor say about electronic surveillance? Exercise L18. Understanding Inferences. 1. At her trial, Mata Hari was dubbed the greatest spy of the First World War, of World War I. Her French accusers brought eight charges of spying against her. However, research suggests that she, Mata Hari, was not really a spy. 
Mata Hari was probably given a sentence for spying. Two. By the way, Fred, I heard, um, someone said that you took an interesting course last summer. What'd you take? I did. It was a course on building adobe houses. You know, houses made of mud. What? Houses of mud? Are you joking? No, no, I'm not. First, we studied the styles of traditional adobe homes in different parts of the world. That was interesting. Then we learned the techniques of mixing sand, straw, and water. Then we put the mixture into molds to dry, and, and when the mud bricks were ready, we built a structure of our own. The class's own structure, not each of us making one. A group effort. So, when are you going to build your house of mud? Well, not in the near future. Well, you'll have to let us know so we can help you. We, well, I, at least, used to like making mud pies as a kid. The woman will probably sign up for the course. Three. A fossil of an extinct and previously unknown seabird has been excavated. This bird has been identified as history's largest flying seabird. The fossils indicate that it had a wingspan of more than 18 feet, and it probably weighed around 90 pounds. Now, if we compare that to the largest seabird of today, the albatross, the albatross weighs up to 20 pounds and has a wingspan of about 11 feet. The albatross is the largest living seabird today. There are probably many fossils of today's albatross. Four. The synovial membranes in the body produce fluids that lubricate the areas between the bones. Besides lubricating these areas, they also keep the cartilage tissues in good condition. So, can anyone tell me why it's important to keep the cartilage tissues in good condition? Well, cartilage tissues protect the ends of the bones. They kind of act like elastic shock absorbers. That's right. Now, if the cartilage tissues are damaged, regeneration is slowed down or stopped. Yes, Linda? Yeah, once cartilage has been damaged... Is there anything that can be done to repair the damage? Well, there are experiments being conducted to renew damaged cartilage by transplanting synovial membrane cells. And so far, the results have been encouraging, very encouraging, in fact. But further experiments need to be conducted before a decision can be made concerning their use on humans. The transplant operation of synovial membrane cells has probably not been done on humans. Exercise L19. Drawing Conclusions. 1. Polio is a crippling disease that you've all heard about. It reached epidemic proportions during the 1950s. Unfortunately, many sufferers from that decade started experiencing a return of the symptoms 30 years later. Strange, isn't it? The reason behind this recurrence isn't yet understood but it has given scientists further information about the disease. For what field might the new information about polio be most useful? Two. I'd really like to get my foreign language requirements out of the way, but I went to register, and when I got there to sign up for beginning Spanish, all the Spanish courses were closed. So, do you have any suggestions, Dr. Abbott? Well, if you're insisting on getting your requirement out of the way, you could sign up for a different language. The Italian teacher on our staff is excellent, and the classes are smaller, so there's more opportunity to practice speaking. Hmm. I never thought of Italian. Thanks for the advice. 
What will the man probably do as a result of this conversation? Three. You were telling us about the famous fashion designer Jean Muir yesterday at the end of the class period, but we had to rush off. I know it wasn't part of your lecture, but we thought it was interesting. Could you finish what you were saying? Sure. What were you interested in? Well, you were talking about her discovery that she had terminal cancer and how she set about changing the way she managed her fashion business. But you didn't get into those changes. I'd like to know what things she did. I was just saying that she concentrated her time and energy on four women. These women had worked for her over the years. So Muir gradually increased their responsibilities and their training. Together, they worked on both Muir's mainline collection and the studio collection using her original ideas and patterns. At the time of her death, she had left enough material for these women to produce collections for 20 years. She was really passionate about design, wasn't she? Why might Jean Muir have given so much attention to her staff? Four. Two University of Alaska professors devised a novel way of getting junior high school students interested in the economic history of their state. How many of you are interested in the economic history of your state? No hands up. Uh-huh. Okay. So, these professors produced a 120-page comic book that traces the economic history of Alaska from the mid-18th century until the granting of statehood in 1959. Most adolescents seem to find the comic book format a more entertaining way for learning a subject. So, this seems to be the ideal way to pass on information. The writers use fictional and historical characters to illustrate economic concepts and historical events, such as the hunting of whales and the Klondike gold rush of the 1890s. The response from students was overwhelmingly enthusiastic. And, as you can imagine, teachers also appreciated the ease with which their students grasped economic concepts taught in this way. To what group of university students might this talk have been given? Exercise L20. Inferring Reasons. 1. I saw in the course catalog that the university is offering a batik class this semester. Is it still open? I don't know. Do you have the course number? 309. Let me see. Uh, yeah, it's open. It meets Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 9 o'clock. Do you know if it can be used to, as an undergraduate, um to meet undergraduate course requirements for art majors? Just a minute. Uh, yes, it fulfills course requirements for both art and home economics majors. Good. I'd like to register for it, please. Why does the woman ask if the course meets the requirements for art majors? Two. Sound-activated toys. A toy that responds whenever the child talks to it. These toys are just one example of how high technology has affected childhood experience. There's a doll on the market that has a memory like a personal computer. It has a soft face that looks alive because it moves when the doll speaks. Its eyes respond to light by blinking, its hands are sensitive to heat, and it has a voice recognition facility that gives it the ability to respond to the child playing with it. But one of the things we have found, uh, considering all the high technology that goes into making such uh, expensive toys, you may be surprised, or maybe not be surprised, to find that children become bored with the new toy after its novelty has worn off.
what children get the most out of, uh, children seem to get the most lasting enjoyment from balls, ordinary sticks, uh, common cardboard boxes. This is probably because these toys can be turned into anything the child's imaginative play needs. Whereas a high-tech doll is just that, a doll. It can never be anything else. Why does the speaker mention balls, sticks, and boxes? Three. Before we go over those sentences I asked you to translate for today, I want to announce that the Foreign Language Department has set up a foreign film festival. Uh, it will take place during the first two weeks of November. I'm especially excited about the Spanish language films they'll be showing. There are two from Spain and three from Mexico. Besides those films, Chile, Argentina, Cuba are represented. And uh, just a minute. Oh, yes, there's a Puerto Rican film that takes place among the New York City Puerto Rican population. These films will give you a wonderful opportunity to listen to regional accents. I've posted a schedule of all the movies outside the door of the Foreign Language Department office. I've also typed up a list of the names, days, and times of just those in Spanish, which I'll pass out at the end of the hour. Okay, now I realize that some of these showings may conflict with your individual schedules, but I recommend that you try to make every effort to get to as many movies as possible. Why does the professor encourage students to see the films? Four. I think you all know the reason I'm here. Sadly, well, first of all, I want to say I regret that violent crime has reached our campus. And, of course, until the perpetrator is caught, all of you need to take extra precautions. I know some of you are frightened, and I don't mean to frighten you anymore. I want to assure you that assault is a very rare occurrence here, and the chances of your becoming a victim are remote. However, as women, we all need to be alert and be cautious here or any other place we go. There are simple procedures we can follow. Um... Try not to be out alone at night, and never use shortcuts like oh, unlit alleyways or routes across vacant lots. Uh, when you're out, walk facing the traffic so a car can't pull up behind you. I know that some of you take night classes. If you don't have anyone to meet you after class, call campus security. They'll send someone to pick you up from your classroom and escort you to your bus, car, or dormitory. At this point, I'd like to introduce Mr. Lang, who's going to demonstrate some ways to protect yourselves through body language, as well as the best ways to conduct yourselves if, if you are confronted. He will also teach you some techniques to break someone's hold on you if it should become necessary. So, I'd like you to welcome Mr. Lang. Why is the speaker giving the talk at this time? The program continues on the next CD.